Welcome to the Human Capital Innovations Podcast, your go-to source for personal, professional, and organizational growth and development. We hope you tune in often for all things people management, organizational development and change, organizational leadership, and social impact related. Maximize your personal and organizational potential with Human Capital Innovations Podcast. Welcome to the Human Capital Innovations Podcast. As part of our inspiring TED Talk series spotlighting can't miss TED Talks and their key takeaways, today I explore Fields Wicker Murin's famous 2009 TED Talk, Learning from Leadership's Missing Manual. Welcome back to the Human Capital Innovations Podcast. It's great to be with you again today for this inspiring TED Talks episode. Today, I'll be exploring the 2009 TED Talk, Learning from Leadership's Missing Manual by Fields Wicker Murin. Leadership doesn't have a user's manual, but Fields Wicker Murin says stories of remarkable local leaders are the next best thing. At a TED salon in London, she shares three. Thank you for joining me, and I'll catch you on the flip side of this first clip. I'm going to talk about some of my discoveries around the world through my work. These are not discoveries of planets or new technologies or science. They're discoveries of people and the way people are and new leadership. This is Benki. Benki is a leader of the Ashaninka nation. His people live in Brazil and in Peru. Benki comes from a village so remote up in the Amazon that to get there, either you have to fly and land on water or go by canoe for several days. I met Binky three years ago in Sao Paulo when I brought him and other leaders from indigenous peoples to meet with me and leaders from around the world because we wanted to learn from each other. We wanted to share our stories with each other. The Ashaninka people are known throughout South America for their dignity, their spirit, and their resistance, starting with the Incas, and continuing through the 19th century with the rubber tappers. Today's biggest threat to the Ashaninka people and to Benki comes from illegal logging, people who come into the beautiful forest and cut down ancient mahogany trees, float them down the river to rolled markets. Benki knew this. He could see what was happening to his forest, to his environment, because he was taken under his grandfather's wing when he was only two years old to begin to learn about the forest and the way of life of his people. His grandfather died when he was only 10. And at that young age, 10 years old, Benki became the Paje of his community. Now, in the Ashaninka tradition and culture, the Paje is the most important person in the community. This is the person who contains within him all the knowledge, all the wisdom of centuries and centuries of life and not just about his people, but about everything that his people's survival depended on. The trees, the birds, the water, the soil, the forest. So when he was only 10 and he became the Paje, he began to lead his people. He began to talk to them about the forest that they needed to protect, the way of life they needed to nurture. He explained to them that it was not a question of survival of the fittest. It was a question of understanding what they needed to survive and to protect that. So as she starts her TED Talk, she explains a little bit about her background and then moves directly into telling three really important and powerful stories about different leaders within different contexts and how they go about their life in trying to make a difference. 
And one of the things I, that I hope you'll pay attention to throughout her TED Talk is really some of the simple principles that you see in action through their examples. This first story, I think, is really interesting to me because you have this remote village. You have this young boy who takes over as the padre, as the leader of the village. And they're dealing with deforestation issues and their connection to the planet, their connection to each other and their forest that they've relied on for so long. And I can just picture this young boy carrying the weight of that responsibility, trying to understand how to help his people, trying to understand the complexity of the challenges that he and his people are facing and trying to figure out how to move forward. I can, I can just sense the weight that must be on his shoulders as he recognizes his youth, he recognizes his inexperience. And one of the things that really just sticks out to me from that is that he must be someone who is very serious and willing to take on that kind of a role, someone who recognizes the importance of the people he is serving and that he sees himself truly as a server of people rather than someone entitled to power and authority and the admiration of his people. Surely he, he gained those elements. Surely he had power and influence and surely he had their admiration through the way he led them and the way he tried to respond to the challenges that they were facing. But it started with him accepting the responsibility, bearing that weight, and then simply being humble and trying to move forward to make a difference and serving his people. Eight years later, when he was a young man of 18, Benki left the forest for the first time. He went 3,000 miles on an odyssey to Rio, to the Earth summit, to tell the world what was happening in his tiny little corner. And he went because he hoped the world would listen. Some did, not everybody. But if you can imagine this young man with his headdress and his flowing robe, learning a new language, Portuguese, not to mention English, going to Rio, building a bridge to reach out to people he'd never met before, a pretty hostile world. But he wasn't dismayed. Binky came back to his village full of ideas, new technologies, new research, new ways of understanding what was going on. Since that time, he's continued to work with his people, and not only the Ashinika Nation, but all the peoples of the Amazon and beyond. He's built schools to teach children to care for the forest. Together, he's led the reforestation of over 25% of the land that had been destroyed by the loggers. He's created a cooperative to help people diversify their livelihoods, and he's brought the internet and satellite technology to the forest, both so the people themselves could monitor the deforestation, but also so that they could speak from the forest to the rest of the world. If you were to meet Binky and ask him, why are you doing this? Why are you putting yourself at risk? Why are you making yourself vulnerable to what is often a hostile world? He would tell you, as he told me, I asked myself, he said, what did my grandparents and my great-grandparents do to protect the forest for me? And what am I doing? So when I think of that, I wonder what our grandchildren and our great-grandchildren, when they ask themselves that question, I wonder how they will answer. He took on the challenge. He stepped up to the plate, uh, whatever metaphor you want to use. Uh, he really bore the weight that was on his shoulders, and he's made the most of it. Learning and growing, talking to others, networking, connecting, uh, this, this young boy growing into a man leading this village has made such a difference because he was humble, because he was willing to step up, because he was willing to learn, because he was willing to make the effort. Leaders don't have all the answers. Leaders don't magically just know how to solve problems, but the good leaders know that they need to lean on others. They need to rely on their people. They need to foster trust and cooperation 
and then they need to own their decisions and the outcomes. And that as they humbly serve their people, they will have the opportunity to make a difference. For me, the world is veering towards a future we don't much want when we really think about it deep inside. It's a future we don't know the details of, but it's a future that has signs, just like Binky saw the signs around him. We know we are running out of what we need. We're running out of fresh water. We're running out of fossil fuels. We're running out of land. We know climate change is going to affect all of us. We don't know how, but we know it will. And we know that there will be more of us than ever before, five times as many people in 40 years than 60 years ago. We are running out of what we need. And we also know that the world has changed in other ways, that since 1960, there are one-third as many new countries that exist as independent entities on the planet. Egos, systems of government, figuring it out, massive change. And in addition to that, we know that five other really big countries are going to have a say in the future, a say we haven't even really started to hear yet. China, India, Russia, South Africa, and Binky's own Brazil, where Binky got his civil rights only in the 1988 Constitution. But you know all that. You know more than Binky knew when he left his forest and went 3,000 miles. You also know that we can't just keep doing what we've always done because we'll get the results we've always gotten. And this reminds me of something I understand Lord Salisbury said to Queen Victoria over 100 years ago when she was pressing him, please change. He said, change? Why change? Things are bad enough as they are. We have to change. Um, it's imperative to me when I look around the world that we need, we need to change ourselves. We need new models of what it means to be a leader. We need new models of being a leader and a human in the world. I started life as a banker. Now, I don't admit to that to anybody but my very close friends. <laughs> but for the past eight years, I've done something completely different. My work has taken me around the world where I've had the real privilege of meeting people like Benke and many others who are making change happen in their communities. People who see the world differently, who are asking different questions, who have different answers, who understand the filters that they wear when they go out into the world. There are so many challenges facing us in the world today. Um, obviously, there's issues like climate change, that came up in her first uh, example, uh, deforestation and, and the effects of climate change. Other environmental types of issues, and it highlights the stewardship that we have over this planet and how we choose to respond to it. Leaders, those who lead organizations, those who lead communities, those who lead governments, they're facing all of these challenges, and she outlined many. And whether we're talking about climate change or we're talking about uh, social inequality, we're talking about ineffective organizations uh, that aren't meeting the needs of their people or their consumers who are having difficulty bringing value to the market, whatever form of leadership that we're talking about, all leaders need to be able to step up to the plate to address these very difficult challenges and to drive change. Now, obviously, this is very difficult. If it wasn't, then we would have solved our challenges. But it takes a consistent, sustained effort over a long period of time of our best people, our best thinkers, and those who can then implement and put into policy and practice those areas that will allow us to move forward into a better future and leave better outcomes and a better world for our grandchildren. That's what we need from our leaders of today. And it's possible, but it is challenging. And we had one great example already of a leader who is addressing these types of challenges head on. And you're about to hear a couple more.
I'm excited to announce the publication of my new book from HCI Press, The Alchemy of Truly Remarkable Leadership, Ordinary Everyday Actions That Produce Extraordinary Results. Consider how the nature of work has shifted over the past 50 years. With increased globalization, rapid technological advancement, and the shift in economic composition, the average job of today looks very different than the average job of 50 years ago. What will the jobs and organizations of tomorrow look like? Moreover, what does this all mean for organizational leaders? What are the core competencies and capabilities of organizations and their leadership that are prepared for continued disruption and geopolitical and socioeconomic shifts? Regardless of what the future holds, increasingly, leaders need to be socially minded, data driven, decisive, champions of talent, and disruptors of the traditional notions of leadership, teams, organizations, and work. The alchemy of truly remarkable leadership will help you to explore your own leadership competencies and capabilities and consider ways to apply and implement them into your workplace and personal life. This is Sangamitra. Sangamitra comes from Bangalore. I met Sangamitra eight years ago when I was in Bangalore organizing a workshop with leaders of different NGOs working on some of the hardest aspects of society. Sangamitra didn't start life as a leader of an NGO. She started her career as a university professor teaching English literature. But she realized that she was much too detached from the world doing that. She loved it, but she was too detached. And so in 1993, a long time ago, she decided to start a new organization called Samrangsha focused on one of the hardest areas, one of the hardest issues in India, anywhere in the world at the time, HIV AIDS. Since that time, Sam Ranksha has grown from strength to strength and is now one of the leading health NGOs in India. But if you just think about the state of the world and knowledge of HIV AIDS in 1993, in India at that time, it was skyrocketing and nobody understood why. And everyone was actually very, very afraid. Today, there are still three million HIV-positive people in India. That's the second largest population in the world. When I asked Sankarmita, how did you get from English literature to HIV-AIDS? Not an obvious path. She said to me, it's all connected. Literature makes one sensitive, sensitive to people, to their dreams, and to their ideas. Since that time, under her leadership, Sam Ranksha has been a pioneer in all fields related to HIV AIDS. They have respite homes, the first, the first care centers, the first counseling services, and not just an urban seven million population Bangalore, but in the hardest to reach villages in the state of Karnataka. Even that wasn't enough. She wanted to change policy at the government level. Ten of their programs that she pioneered are now government policy and funded by the government. They take care of 20,000 odd people today in over 1,000 villages around Karnataka. Another inspiring example, someone who saw a really challenging problem. And think about HIV AIDS, uh, especially back then. Uh, it's still challenging now, uh, for sure. Uh, but even back, you know, back then, there were so many unknowns, so many more unknowns, and it gripped the world. Uh, and in India, it, it took such a hold and it was having such a negative impact. She, as a professor, uh, she was making a difference. She was shaping young minds. She was preparing future leaders. That's not a small thing. That's something that I take a lot of pride in, in my own work as a professor. But she saw this need. She saw something more that needed to be addressed. And through her work, she emerged, she made that transition from being a professor and teaching and preparing young minds to lead in the future to taking on that mantle herself and leading one of the foremost NGOs addressing the HIV AIDS problem, really becoming uh, the expert in all things related to HIV AIDS. That is incredible. And it must have been incredibly um, challenging to do and it, it represents a lot of courage and bravery that she was willing to, to step away from 
this comfortable life as a professor, a sheltered life, a privileged life, one that that honestly, you know, while you're going to have your ups and downs like anyone else, it's it's you're free of a lot of those types of challenges because of the security you face, because um, because of uh, the nature of the job. That's something that I I recognize. I know I know that that's something that I am privileged um, to to enjoy. But she stepped away from it all, put her career on the line because of the need. Again, like in the first example, because she was humble enough to, to see the challenges and willing to step up to the plate to meet that challenge. She works with people like Morali Krishna. Morali Krishna comes from one of those villages. He lost his wife to AIDS a couple of years ago, and he's HIV positive. But he saw the work, the care, the compassion that Sangramitra and her team brought to the village, and he wanted to be part of it. He's a Leaders Quest fellow, and that helps him with his work. They've pioneered a different approach to villages. Instead of handing out information and pamphlets, as is so often the case, they bring theater troops, songs, music, dance, and they sit around and they talk about dreams. Sangramitra told me just last week she had just come back from two weeks in the villages, and she had a real breakthrough. They were sitting in a circle talking about the dreams for the village. And the young women in the village spoke up and said, we've changed our dream. Our dream is for our partners, our husbands, not to be given to us because of a horoscope, but to be given to us because they've been tested for HIV. If you were lucky enough to meet Sangamitra and ask her, why and how? How have you achieved so much? She would look at you and very quietly, very softly say, it just happened. It's the spirit inside. Now, how many leaders do you know of large, incredibly successful organizations where you are the expert in your field in all things related to a particular issue? And when someone asks you, how did you make it happen? Your first response is, it, it just happened. It was inside me. The, the level of humility, uh, setting aside the ego, recognizing that, yeah, I, obviously she was incredibly successful. Obviously she, she had a lot of talents that she brought to the table. But she wasn't all caught up in taking credit. She was about making a difference. And she recognized that there was something inside of her that helped to drive that change. Now, I don't want to oversimplify, and I don't want to suggest that we shouldn't be trying to develop knowledge, skills, and abilities, competencies, and capabilities related to leadership. I, I obviously don't believe that because that's so much of what I do. That's why this podcast even exists, is because I think we can learn how to be better leaders. But you can't just learn it. You can't just learn it by listening to a podcast or watching a video or reading a book. You have to apply it. And surely along the way, she interacted with other leaders and saw good and bad examples. She read books. She listened to talks. Surely those things all happened. But where she is different than so many others is that she immediately moved into application. She moved in to making sure she was actually living the principles and as she was living those principles and staying humble, she was able to make tremendous impact on those around her. This is Dr. Fan John Chuan. John Chuan comes from Sichuan province in southwest China. He was born in 1957, and you can imagine what his childhood looked like and felt like, and what his life has been like over the last 50 tumultuous years. He's been a soldier, a teacher, a politician, a vice mayor, and a businessman. But if you sat down and asked him, who are you really, and what do you do, he would tell you, I'm a collector, and I curate a museum. I was lucky, I had heard about him for years, and I finally met him earlier this year at his museum in Chengdu. He's been a collector all of his life, starting when he was four or five in the early 1960s, or just think of the early 1960s in China. 
over a lifetime through everything, through the Cultural Revolution and everything afterwards, he's kept collecting so that he now has over 8 million pieces in his museums documenting contemporary Chinese history. These are pieces that you won't find anywhere else in the world, in part because they document parts of history Chinese choose to forget. For example, he's got over one million pieces documenting the Sino-Japanese War, a war that's not talked about in China very much, and whose heroes are not honored. Why did he do all this? Because he thought a nation should never repeat the mistakes of the past. So, from commissioning slightly larger-than-life bronze statues of the heroes of the Sino-Japanese War, including those Chinese who then fought with each other and left mainland China to go to Taiwan, to commemorating all the unknown ordinary soldiers who survived by asking them to take prints of their hands, he is making sure, one man, is making sure that history is not forgotten. But it's not just Chinese heroes he cares about. This building contains the world's largest collection of documents and artifacts commemorating the U.S. role in fighting on the Chinese side in that long war, the Flying Tigers. He has nine other buildings that are already open to the public, filled to the rafters with artifacts documenting contemporary Chinese history. Two of the most sensitive buildings include a lifetime of collection about the Cultural Revolution, a period that actually most Chinese would prefer to forget. But he doesn't want his nation ever to forget. In this third example, you have someone who recognizes the importance of history, someone who recognizes the importance of learning from that history, learning from our past and never repeating those most negative times of our history. Again, that, that requires a certain level of humility. It also requires courage. I mean, think about his endeavor in China and how that must go against so much of the establishment. Uh, that, that's a bit of a scary thing, especially uh, in, in a region that doesn't always want to air its dirty, dirty laundry and doesn't want to acknowledge those painful areas of the past. But he's single-handedly making sure that he preserves that past, making sure that he tells that story, making sure that he honors those that need to be honored so that that history isn't erased and so that people can continue to learn from it. What you see in all three of these examples is humility, you see courage, you see willingness to step into the unknown, to take on challenges even when you don't have a good answer. That is incredibly impressive to me and something that I think most leaders need to strive to emulate and that most of us really can do much better at. These people inspire me, and they inspire me because they show us what is possible when you change the way you look at the world, change the way you look at your place in the world. They looked outside, and then they changed what was on the inside. They didn't go to business school. They didn't read a manual, how to be a good leader in 10 easy steps. But they have qualities we'd all recognize. They have drive, passion, commitment. They've gone away from what they did before, and they've gone to something they didn't know. They've tried to connect worlds they didn't know existed before. They've built bridges, and they've walked across them. They have a sense of the great arc of time and their tiny place in it. They know people have come before them and will follow them. And they know that they're part of a whole, that they depend on other people. It's not about them. They know that. But it has to start with them. And they have humility. It just happens. But we know it doesn't just happen, don't we? We know it takes a lot to make it happen. And we know the direction the world is going in. So I think we need succession planning on a global basis. We can't wait for the next generation, the new joiners, to come in and learn how to be the good leaders we need. I think it has to start with us. And we know, just like they knew, how hard it is. 
But the good news is that we don't have to figure it out as we go along. We have models, we have examples, like Benki and Sangamitra and John Chuan. We can look at what they've done if we look. We can learn from what they've learned. We can change the way we see ourselves in the world. And if we're lucky, we can change the way our great-grandchildren will answer Binky's question. Thank you. I also find these examples inspiring. And as I said in my commentary after the last clip, I think it is incredibly important for us to look for good examples around us. In the cases of these three examples, it largely just happened. These weren't individuals that set out to be great leaders. These aren't people that necessarily received a traditional education and being great leaders, you know, getting the graduate degrees and MBAs. Um, they, they didn't necessarily do all of that. But they saw their place in the world. They saw the challenges that needed to be addressed. They saw themselves as instruments for change that they could be change agents and make a difference, a, a meaningful, positive difference by tackling some of these big challenges. They remained humble. They were courageous. They were willing to step into the darkness to take on those challenges, and they were relentless, and they never gave up. They were persistent over a long period of time. Anyone can put forth great effort in a really short-term period, but very few are willing to put in the effort day in, day out, to be able to make a difference. So we look to these types of examples. We look to these types of individuals to find those principles and practices, the, those commonalities that we can uh, take from what they've done so that we can try to apply it into our lives and become better. Now, I say all of that, and I do believe that each of us has that great leadership potential within ourselves. I do believe that great leaders can pop up anywhere, that you don't need to get a degree in leadership. You don't need to get an MBA to be a great leader. And in fact, sometimes uh, formal education can be a hindrance if people aren't humble and they aren't willing to serve their followers. They're not willing to recognize where they sit within the grand scheme of all of these great challenges that they face. But let's not also forget that we truly can develop these skills. They are skills and competencies and capabilities that we can grow in ourselves over time. We can exercise them like any other muscle through application and practice, through self-reflection and continual efforts to learn and grow. We can become better leaders. That is my hope for myself. That's my hope for all my students. That's my hope for all those organizations I work with when I do consulting work. And it's my hope for all of you who are listening. I hope we can all become great leaders, humble leaders, courageous leaders. And together, we can make a difference in the world. We can address these challenges, and we can make the world a better place for our children, for our grandchildren, for everyone to come. Thank you for joining me for this episode of the Human Capital Innovations Podcast. As always, I hope you stay healthy and safe, that you can find meaning and purpose at work each and every day, and I hope you have a great week. We are excited about the launch of HCI's new magazine, Human Capital Leadership. Human Capital Leadership is a free interactive e-magazine designed to help individuals, leaders, and organizations find innovative approaches to maximize their human capital potential. We will be publishing issues quarterly in August, November, February, and May. Check out the first issue and let us know what you think. Thanks again for joining us for this episode of the Human Capital Innovations Podcast. I hope you stay healthy and safe and that you have a great week.